everyone. Thanks for joining uh, Columbus City Council. Um, this has been an incredibly difficult year for Columbus and for our country. Not only have we lost neighbors and family members to COVID-19, but we've lost community members to gun violence. Many feel we've lost trust in law enforcement as well. The murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others sparked a match, uh, sparked a match earlier this year. We saw uprisings, ongoing protests like the ones uh, in which can only be compared to the 1960s civil rights movement. In response to calls uh, to, to action, this council shifted all of its focus towards reform. On June 25th, we held a press conference. We announced that we would advance the largest package of police reform in decades. A little more than four weeks later, on July 27th, we passed all four of those measures. We rewrote our purchasing code to demilitarize our police force. We limited the use of no-knock warrants, the tactic that led to Ms. Taylor's death. We instituted background checks for hate group affiliations. And we put issue two before voters to create an independent civilian review board and office of the inspector general. I'm extremely proud of what this team did in a matter of four weeks. Normally those projects could take months, but we mobilized, you stepped up, and we pushed reform forward. On November 3rd, voters registered their resounding support for issue two with more than 70% of the votes cast in favor of accountability and reform. While I'm proud of these measures, council knows that there is still racism and inequities built into our structures of safety, criminal justice, and our budgets. We're here today to talk about how council will reimagine public safety during this budget process and beyond. We have three key principles, three key pillars that will frame and drive our decisions. First, we need to establish an alternative crisis response system. Columbus currently has an excellent pilot that uh, we that show potential for this new vision. The mobile crisis re uh, response unit and the REACT opioid team both show enormous promise, but we have yet to scale or integrate them fully into our emergency systems. Second, we need to invest in accountability and a better division of police. This starts with the Civilian Review Board and an Office of the Inspector General, but that's not where it ends. We also need to invest in our officers. We have so many good committed officers and we've heard that they want reform too. Third, we need to invest in violence prevention. This means not only going after the shooters on the streets, but making sure young folks have what they need so they never pick up a weapon in the first place. These three pillars will guide our budget process. It's also important to note that one can't separate public safety from critical investments in our operating budget, like affordable housing, pre-K, college access, transit, and more. We know that these investments are connected. We've got to bring a strategic eye to ensure we have a holistic conversation but we also can't overlook what issue two and the, uh, the creation of a civilian review, review board means to this community. At this point, I'd like to turn things over to my council member, my colleague, Rob Dorn, to talk more about issue two, the civilian review board and our focus on accountability. Council member Dorn. Thank you, council president. Um, as you mentioned, when this council stood together this past June to announce our first steps to reimagine public safety, I spoke about the need for transparency and accountability. Too many in our community had lost faith in our current public safety infrastructure. We immediately went to work building the foundation for a civilian review board for Columbus. We met with national experts, we held public hearings, engaged the division of police, along with community leaders to bring transparency and accountability in public safety with a civilian review board. As you mentioned on July 27th of this year, this body unanimously passed Ordinance 1819, sponsored by Council President Hardin and myself, which placed issue two on the ballot. This legislation set in place not only a civilian review board, but just as importantly, an independent investigative body to ensure the board has professional staff who conduct real and transparent investigations 
and to potential police misconduct. I'm incredibly proud that the citizens of Columbus supported issue two with over 74% of the vote. A civilian review board and office inspector general is now enshrined in our city charter, our constitution. I wanna thank Council President Hardin, my colleagues, the mayor, the city attorney, and the voters for making this a reality. That said, our work is not done. In the coming weeks and months, city council will begin to pass legislation formalizing the operations of the board and the inspector general. Soon we will pass an operating budget which will ensure that these bodies have sufficient funding. This is, we heard this over and over again from national experts, the need to ensure that these bodies have sufficient funding to do what they need to do to ensure transparency and accountability. Next, we'll craft legislation to seat board members, set their terms, and other details. I wanna thank the group of community leaders that have been meeting for months to study the most effective ways to structure our review board here in Columbus. We know we have more work to do to create the transparency and accountability for our police force. For months, I've pushed the Division of Police to ensure that all officers at all times while interacting with members of the public have badge numbers readily identifiable. This is critical to ensure that members of the division can be identified in photos or videos when there are allegations of misconduct. We know that a large majority of our officers conduct themselves professionally and properly, but, we, but when we can't identify those that have failed to uphold their duty, all officers get painted with the same brush. This is not acceptable. The recent report issued by the law firm Baker Hosseller makes it clear the lack of police officer identification was a serious problem for the city identifying officers involved in alleged misconduct. I've worked with Chief Quinlan on this issue and pleased that initial steps have been taken. However, we will begin exploring legislation to ensure that all police uniforms have such identification to ensure that officers can be identified. Again, this is both important for members of the public and our officers. This is how we make sure that we have the right foundation in place to bring about transparency and accountability that the public expects and is necessary. Next, I'd like to introduce President Pro Tem and Council's Finance Committee Chair, Elizabeth Brown. This committee will play an incredibly important role in the conversation that we're having around reimagining public safety. President Pro Tem. Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, and thank you all for being here, um, for the, the press who have tuned in. This is an absolutely critical conversation um, for this year and for all years coming ahead of us. Um, when I think about our goal, making all residents safer, I believe that must include reinforcing the covenant of trust between the peace officers we employ and the residents they serve. Of course, as I've said before, it should never look or feel like our residents and neighborhoods are being occupied. That means continuing to demilitarize our division. We are all on the same side here, and we need to enact policies that reinforce that fact. I also know that must include investing in common sense solutions. All those things that you've heard my colleagues say already, and that my colleagues will say in their portions of this event as well, such as our, our 911 dispatch office, where key decisions are made about what kind of help to send to residents who call. We need to train, support, and pay those who work in the dispatch office in a way that reflects their critical role in the process. And we need to integrate our partners into this work to ensure we provide the right response for every call. After all, we can't rely on police officers alone to solve every problem. As we work to stop violence in our city, we can't lose sight of the fact that policing is a response to violence. It does not prevent it on its own. Preventing violence includes community-driven violence intervention efforts. Through the budget process, we need to reinforce key initiatives that we know are effective. Our violence intervention work led by APPS and our partners, Columbus Urban League and Community for New Directions. Our care coalition and the social workers who help residents address their trauma 
and build resilience in the wake of violence in our neighborhoods. And we need to unite these efforts within an overarching strategy for violence prevention in Columbus that will work this year and that will outlast this budget. But these aren't enough on their own. We can't have a conversation about making every resident safe without addressing the economic insecurity impacting Columbus families. Council President said this, and I do believe that it's more relevant than ever this year to emphasize these kinds of solutions. We released a financial empowerment roadmap earlier this fall that demonstrated not only the economic pain of many Columbus families, but also the, the disparate presence, the disproportionate presence of that pain among our families of color. Nearly 40% of black workers in, earn $15,000 or less annually compared to 14% of white workers. 33% of black and 31% of Hispanic households have zero zero net wealth, nearly double that of white households at 17%. In the wake of COVID-19, I'm proud to have worked with members of this council to take bold steps that support families and help residents cope with financial insecurity. Steps like our Right to Recover program, steps like the rental assistance championed with council, by council member favor, Steps like the CARES Act dollars that seeded these lifelines are going to be depleted soon and we can't let off the gas on providing the sorely needed resources that help families meet their basic needs. At the same time, this is going to be a tough budget to work through given the state of our economy and the uncertainty of our economy, quite frankly, as we continue to deal with the impacts of a worldwide pandemic. But as finance chair, I will be looking for ways to continue supporting every family in Columbus. In the coming weeks, Council will hold hearings to review the proposed budget with city departments. Although a review of this budget is closely linked to promoting public safety in every neighborhood of our city, we want to harness the unprecedented, we're, we're going further than the, the typical uh, hearing process because we want to harness the unprecedented public engagement we've received this summer to arrive at solutions that truly move our city forward together and that have the buy-in of, of our residents. So that is why we're going to work with the Saunders Company to facilitate an extensive community engagement process on top of our budget hearings. They will conduct surveys, focus groups, large community events, in the 2020 sense of a large community event, either virtually or under strict COVID-19 safety guidelines, pending the trajectory of our community spread in the coming months. Many people aren't able to engage with city council during traditional hearings. They are busy living their lives, lives that are harder now than they have been recently. Our public engagement around reimagining public safety will focus on engaging with people who typically are not heard through a traditional hearing process, but are directly impacted by the decisions the seven of us make. Our hearings will start tomorrow when I hold the uh, finance, recreation and parks and education budget hearing at three o'clock PM. Other dates of note, include the safety budget hearing hosted by council member Mitch Brown on December 2nd, a reimagining safety hearing on the mayor's reform initiatives on December 9th, and we expect to announce additional hearings and legislation in the coming months. The bottom line is across our city, spanning nearly every point of view, we are all in search of safe communities for ourselves, our families, and our neighbors. That is our North Star throughout this process. I'm now happy to introduce and turn the microphone over to Safety Chair, Council Member Mitch Brown. Thank you, President Pro Tem. And also thank you, Council President Harden. Uh, I appreciate your leadership and all my colleagues' dedication to ensuring our community is safe for all who live, 
work, and visit here. In my years of public safety, I've come to understand the importance of matching the emergency response to meet the situation at hand. This requires investment in people, training, and systems to ensure our first responders effectively serve the residents of Columbus. I believe that an overwhelming majority of our Columbus police officers and firefighters put on their uniforms every day to serve and protect our community. However, I recognize that we as a community have asked our officers to address issues caused by poverty, drug addiction, and mental health. While I know our officers would step up to answer the call, and they have, we cannot and should not enforce our way out of these societal issues. We must continue to build on pilot programs that invest in diversified emergency response through outreach and treatment while continuing to meet our community's high expectations. I've always been supportive of improvements to the Columbus Division of Police. Our division, like all police divisions, needs to be able to adapt and continuously improve. I'm confident that our officers and command staff are capable of progress and growth. However, while we must be adaptive in our treatment of mental health and drug addiction, this council must also maintain our investment and our public safety forces to keep personnel, vehicles, and technology available to respond to our residents in crisis. Violence, specifically gun violence, has had an immense toll on our city and our residents this year. With a record number of shootings and homicides, we must continue to invest in reducing gun violence. With our paramedics, trauma physicians, and nurses, we certainly would have seen more loss of life. It is vital that those who inflict this irreparable damage be held accountable. Our division of police is tasked with bringing these officers to justice, offenders, I'm sorry, to justice. They need the equipment, the training to do as effectively and as safely as possible so they also may go home to their family. Too many in our community are mourning without knowing the circumstances around their loved one's death. We must do a better job as a community to stand up to violence. With proper investment and accountability, I trust that our public safety forces will continue to adapt and improve how they keep our city and its residents safe. I'm committed to supporting them as we work to meet our community's expectations. I invite the community to participate in the public hearing to discuss the 2021 Public Safety Operating Budget on Wednesday, December 2nd at 5 o'clock, as President Pro Tem has already mentioned. And I'd now like to introduce Councilor Emmanuel Remy. Thank you so much, Councilmember Brown. Um, I appreciate your insight and all my colleagues' work on this important issue today. Every resident of Columbus deserves to feel safe in their neighborhood. For some, and understandably so, this means establishing or reestablishing trust in officers responsible for policing our communities. This also means that we need to invest in a better division of police. These investments would include evaluating what calls actually require police response versus other collaborative relationships that can be built with our partners, dispatching specially trained officers and mental health professionals to manage crisis calls, de-escalation and crisis intervention training, which has a focus on being more empathetic and non-judgmental, mindfulness of nonverbal cues and gestures, remaining calm, rational, and professional. These are just a few of many examples in which our officers can appear less threatening and more approachable than they may be today. I also think it's important your police force be reflective of the community it serves. We are lucky to live in a city that is so rich in culture, diverse residents, and more inclusivity. Unfortunately, we also live in a city where our police force is lacking in diversity. As chair of the administration committee, which includes the human resources department and the civil service commission, it is important to me, as well as my colleagues, that the city of Columbus improve its recruitment efforts. 
I have charged the directors of both departments with assuring that our recruitment efforts extend to every Columbus community, including our new American and immigrant communities. We want to make sure that every resident has the opportunity of apl to apply for employment opportunities within the police force, prepare for civil service testing, and that screening and testing barriers that may have historically hindered diversity are removed. Navigating the Civil Service Commission and the process in which it takes to get hired by the City of Columbus can be hard for some. Our Civil Service team has done a great job in providing the training to help all get through the process, but that's not good enough. There is more work to do, and I have challenged my team to find a way to modernize our Civil Service Commission to serve a progressive 21st century Columbus. Later this evening, during our regular City Council meeting, we will vote on Ordinance Number 2562-2020, which will authorize the Civil Service Commission to con contract with Winf Winfred Arthur, Jr., Ph.D., for the execution of an independent audit of the Col Columbus Police Officer Recruiting and Testing Process in accordance with Recommendation Number 13 of the Columbus Community Safety Advisory Committee. This will be an $80,000 investment to improve how we test and recruit our officers. We also understand the importance of having a mechanism in place for new recruits and seasoned officers to speak up when they witness inappropriate behavior displayed by their fellow colleagues. It is important that they have a voice to share their concerns about the attitudes or actions of other officers without fear of retaliation. This is why we want to build and provide this reporting mechanism for our officers. We are working on the potential for the city to institute a fraud, waste, and abuse line for our employees to utilize anonymously and privately so there is transparency and accountability. Lastly, it is critical that we invest and strengthen early warning systems to root out bad and or problematic officers. I would argue that it is a small number of officers causing the majority of the problems. The goal is to implement a system that will identify behaviors that lead to adverse interactions with the public and provide correction, identify resources to mitigate behavior, or remove these officers from the field. In closing, I would like to thank all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in this morning. And without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Council Member Shayla Faber. Thank you, Council Member Remy, and good morning to everyone joining us virtually today. I'm proud to be here along with my colleagues as we continue our efforts to reimagine public safety in Columbus. As Chair of Council's Housing and Criminal Justice Committees, I will be focusing my efforts over the next several months on advancing investments in these areas. Housing is a basic, essential need, yet far too many in our community are unable to access safe, decent, and affordable housing. Not only are too many families paying more than half of their income on rent, our city continues to grow at a fast pace, and we will be unable to keep up with the high housing demand. We must invest in more building and maintaining a housing stock that can support the needs of all of our residents, including those who are low income, seniors, and disabled. I'm proud of recent projects and developer commitments to build housing at 60% AMI and below. This is progress, but we have much more to do. I look forward to continuing my advocacy in this area and putting the proper resources in place to support our growing needs around housing. Additionally, we find ourselves in the midst of an eviction crisis that disproportionately impacts women of color and their children. A permanent tenant-based rental assistance program can go a long way towards protecting our most vulnerable residents and keeping them off of our streets and away from an overburdened shelter system. These are the types of investments I know can improve the trajectory of our city. Also, essential to our future is our youth. This year, we've seen an unprecedented rise in youth-led violence. Our young people need our support, and we must take their needs seriously. Whether it is early intervention measures to help youth find jobs, 
and other opportunities to deter them from violence, or if it is working intentionally within our juvenile justice system to effectively prepare them to re-enter society, we must do more to meet their demands. I'm committed to this work, and I want to see all of us commit to putting the proper resources in place to support the future of Columbus. I strongly believe that reimagining public safety means we must make strides to reinvest in our community. I'm looking forward to interacting with our residents and other stakeholders in the coming months to determine how we can invest in the best initiatives for all of us. And with that, I would now like to introduce my colleague, Council Member Tyson. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Favor. And, uh, and I wanna thank all the viewing and listening residents this morning to uh, our council talking about reimagining public safety. This morning, I'm gonna take a few moments to reflect on reimagining public safety and gun violence through the lens of public health. When we think about public health, and the social determinants of health, we must recognize that African-Americans are disproportionately affected by numerous inequities, which include housing, as council member Faber stated, crime, incarceration, education, employment, poverty, food insecurity, healthcare, and public safety. On November 13th, we, re we learned that more than 144 of our fellow residents have been murdered in this community, 75% of them being African Americans. And while any murder is unacceptable, we must now balance this injustice in the context of racial equity. What might appear to be a linkage between race and crime is in large part a function of concentrated urban poverty which is far more common for African Americans than any other racial group. So as I begin to think about reimagining public, public safety, we really have to focus on equity is at the center of all the work that we do. As chair of Health and Human Services Committee, I recognize that as we move forward with reimagining policing, police say public safety, I'm sorry, from a public health perspective, we need to get behind programs that support violence prevention, which is the use of violence interrupters and youth engagement, like our APPS program and our many other nonprofit partners that have programs to reduce this inequity. Um, as we're making sure that yeah, violence, um, these programs and things, as Council Member Favor said, looking, making sure that our young people have opportunities for employment but also our young people have opportunities to, again, work with those amazing nonprofit partners. And some of those are sororities and fraternities um, that are working with our youth each and every day to give them positive outlets to move forward. Also, we have to support the use of alternative responses, such as we see with the CARE Coalition. We must also have authentic community engagement, which reaches out to normally excluded groups. We also have to work on jail reduction and reforms that, allow, that will allow low level offenders to reduce their sentences. And we must also recognize our fiscal constraints, especially in this time of COVID-19. How do we manage our reforms um, in a manner in which we're getting things done, but thinking about the environment in which we, in, we are in. And then we also have to recognize that policing is an only one element, again, of reimagining policing. But in, in that area, we have to focus on the use of force, training, recruitment, accountability, and community policing. In conclusion for me, when we reimagine public safety and gun violence through the lens of public health, we need to remember that feeling safe and protected goes beyond policing. To feel safe, there must be efforts to address racial disparities and poverty. We must help each other to recognize our humanity and the value that each of us brings to one another as human beings. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to President Harden. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. Uh, and thank you to all of my colleagues. You've heard uh, my colleagues talk about the importance of investing in violence prevention and a better division of police. 
These are critical elements to reimagining safety in our city. The third pillar of this initiative, my top priority is to establish a new specialized crisis response system. It is worth stepping back to reflect on what we ask of police. For decades, we've asked law enforcement to handle mental health, substance abuse, homelessness, poverty, violent crime, property damage, car accidents, and more. That's a lot for any profession to handle. Police officers have an incredibly difficult job. They're asked to play pickup games, to bond with kids, solve murders, document accidents, and de-escalate violent situations, and that could all be in one day. Our officers do the best they can given the vast set of problems thrown at them on the job. And being an officer has only gotten harder since COVID swept across our country and violent crime spiked. 911 call data uh, reveals that much of what our officers are asked to deal with are problems they may not have the exact tools to solve. In 2019 in Columbus, there were more than 14,000 calls for suicides and mental health disturbances, more than 11,000 calls for wellness checks. My top priority for the re Reimagining Public Safety Initiative is to ensure that those calls and more can be answered by unarmed crisis response workers who can help provide uh, folks with the care and the resources that they need. A specialized crisis response division can provide the opportunity to improve resident safety while freeing up sworn officers to focus on instances that do require the attention of armed law enforcement. This will mean hiring mental health specialists, homeless outreach workers, social workers, and other crisis response. Establishing a specialized uh, crisis response system also means changing the way local government receives, dispatches, and addresses nonviolent calls. A friend of mine recently tried to call a wellness check on another friend. She even knew about the mobile crisis response unit, so she called the non-emergency number. None of the options presented spoke to her friend's needs. When she got through to a person, a city employee told her to call Adam H. So she called Adam H, and they suggested that she call 911. She called 911, and they told her to call the non-emergency number. That's unacceptable for our system. We need an integrated response model where folks have clear options from other cities from, uh, that are, are on this front. Through the National League of Cities Council Presidents Group, I spent an hour on the phone with folks who run Eugene, Oregon's program, Crisis Assistance Helping Out of the Streets, or better known as CAHOOTS. The program mobilizes two-person teams consisting of a medic and a crisis worker who have substantial training and experience in the mental health field. The teams deal with a wide range of mental health-related issues, including conflict resolution, welfare checks, substance abuse, suicide threats, and more, relying on trauma-informed de-escalation and harm reduction techniques. The program cost about $2.1 million annually in 2017. And the CAHOOTS team answered 17% of Eugene Police Department's overall call volume, saving Eugene an estimated $8.5 million in public safety spending annually. We see other cities around the country adopting similar models, Albuquerque, Denver, Houston, and more. We have a model for this in Columbus where we pair mental health workers with officers, but it's not even close to handling the call volume for these cases. I want to acknowledge and thank Mayor Ginther for putting additional dollars into Columbus Mobile Crisis Response Unit. This is an important step in the right direction. Additionally, this year's capital budget contained more than $3 million for a new Adam H. Center that will provide many of the services that our residents need. Establishing an alternative crisis response system that can adequately answer the calls for service will require a multi-year effort. But it starts with this operating budget. Now, some people have told me that they're tired of talking about reimagining safety. They think because protests are over, the work is done. Well, this council is here to tell you that we aren't anywhere close to done with this. Reform is a marathon, not a sprint. I'm appreciative that my colleagues are committed to this process just like I am, but our voices aren't enough. We need to hear from the community to ensure that we're able to follow through on these principles in a way that works for Columbus. Our next steps to reimagine public safety, our first passing ordinance 2562-2020 uh, tonight 
to audit our civil service and recruiting process for public safety. Second would be holding the two public engagement uh, hearings. The first on December 2nd, chaired by uh, Chair uh, Mitch Brown. Uh, and the second hearing is a special focus on items in the mayor's proposed budget that advance reform. Beyond that, the Saunders company, company will host focus groups, citywide surveys, and large events to garner more feedback from the community. Then we'll pass a budget in February. We've got a work ahead of us, but I'm confident that through this process and with the community engaged, we can usher in a safer, more prosperous city. At this time, I, we will uh, take a few questions from members of the media. We're gonna use the raise hand function. Uh, you, can, uh, you should see a hand icon in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. After you press that icon, you should see a hand next to your name in the attendee list. Uh, when you're called in, you'll be unmuted. Please specify if you'd like to address your question to a particular council member. Please say your name and what media outlet you're with. Uh, and after you ask your question, please click the icon again to lower your hand. I see a question from uh, Lacey Chris. Good morning. I was wondering if you could explain the proposal to move the 911 service out from underneath CPD and move it into public safety. Why do that? What are the benefits and um, what, why this move right now? What we are, uh, thank you, Lacey, for the question. What we are kicking off today is a process, a process of talking with uh, the residents, but also with the administration about proposed um, uh, actions in this budget uh, and proposals that we might hear from residents. And so uh, we look forward to, to having those, those engagements over the next several months uh, and seeing what, what makes sense uh, and, and how we move forward. I think that that's just one um, uh, step in one proposal in, in really reimagining what public safety looks like in Columbus and making sure that our responders, um, uh, that our responder system uh, works uh, uh, in an appropriate way. I'd ask, um, does Councilmember Mitch Brown, Chair Brown, do you have any uh, other comments on that? Thank you, Council President. Again, uh, the issue with regards to the dispatchers, again, the training and education that's required and it's going to be increased. Uh, the ability to differentiate the type of responses that are going to be going out uh, is going to be significant. And taking the individuals and putting them under public safety is just a way of making certain that the individuals who are able to receive the training uh, and have the adequate staffing that is necessary for our 911 call center to improve. Um, that's, good. that's the first link. Um, when citizens want, uh, need help, they dial 911. We want to make certain that the response is appropriate to the request. And that's part of the rationale for making the move. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Lacey. I think I see Bethany Bruner. Good morning, Council. I appreciate you guys taking some questions. Um, I wanted to touch on the community engagement aspect of this. How are you going to make sure that all communities in Columbus are heard and that this isn't going to be a, a survey that is sent out and we get the responses from people that are more civically engaged in some of our more um, more educated, more affluent communities. And we're hearing from people, you know, in Rosemond and South Linden on Parsons Avenue and making sure that those people that are most directly impacted, particularly by the violence this year, are being heard in this conversation as well. Thank you, Bethany. I'm going to kick that one over to President Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, so we're going to work with um, folks who do this more professionally, the Saunders Company, um, to help make sure that the design of the engagement actually reflects reaching people. And look, I will be uh, honest that it's harder during COVID, right? Um, a lot of the tactics that we've used to try to bolster authentic community engagement will be harder to do, um, which is why um, depending on our numbers, uh, we can't rely just on virtual engagement. If there are safe ways to do live engagement and our numbers, uh, a virus infection numbers 
um, reflect the ability to do so, we will. Um, I think another important piece is engaging partners um, who serve uh, folks on the ground in these neighborhoods on a, on a regular basis. Um, so it's not, you know, city of Columbus coming to your neighborhood. It's um, community development for all people, right? Um, so that, you know, we've got that kind of, and I'm just using them as an example, um, but that we've got that kind of community-based um, uh, engagement. One thing um, I think we all know um, is that if a resident um, who largely is marginalized um, by, by kind of typical uh, engagement styles or, um, uh, uh, you know, daily life in the city of Columbus, if they hear from somebody they trust about um, entering a, a conversation, they're much more likely to do it, um, you know, versus, hey, here, here's the city of Columbus, just come and show up. So those are the kinds of strategies that, that we're going to use. And um, we have no ego about being all knowing on this stuff. So uh, we want to hear from residents about how they want to uh, see this engagement happen too. But I also, and I will remind you when we did our public safety hearing process over the summer, um, you know, we saw incredible levels of engagement in those hearings. Um, so, you know, we know that this issue is critically important to residents. So I, do, I think it's a combination of having the authentic conversation through the right channels. Um, because, you know, when we had those hearings throughout the summer, we did see an outpouring of engagement and we did it essentially in the same way you're all tuning in today. That's not good enough moving forward, um, but I, I do want to highlight that people are here for this conversation. Thank you, President Platoon. I think Lacey has another question. Thank you. Um, I was wondering in the initial budget uh, proposal, Mayor Ginther said that um, the police department's budget would be cut about $20 million. Does that account for things like 911 being taken out from underneath uh, the CPD's purview to public safety? And I think some may wonder at a time when we're having record levels of violence, record levels of homicides, why take money away from the police department? Thank you, Lacey, again for the question. One of the things that I'm really proud of, of this council is that we've taken, uh, even back in June and July, a very complex issue uh, and worked thoughtfully through engaging uh, stakeholders from public safety and from the community and put forward uh, comprehensive uh, reforms, uh, policies uh, and strategies that, that, that we believe will still continue to keep us safe, but also reform how we do public safety. Uh, we plan on doing that now too, uh, during this, this budget process and working with the administration. Um, again, what we are doing today is kicking off that process, that deep dive into the mayor's budget uh, and uh, inviting the public to be a part of uh, how they view public safety uh, and, 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 and how they plan to move it forward. And so uh, I, I think that we'll have uh, more to say about specifics of the budget as we go through the process. Are there any other questions? Lacey, do you have a follow up? Yeah, I guess, and I know you're, you said you're not looking into specifics, but in the budgets, uh, the mayor's budget proposal, it looked to me like there was a proposal for 50 fewer patrol officers. Um, can you help walk me through the reasoning behind that and, and what they will be replaced with? I'm just trying to get a better grasp on um, the thought behind it. Again, uh, you're talking to the legislative branch. We received the mayor's budget. We're, we're excited about it. We think that it, it points into a direction of uh, reimagining public safety, but we will have to run that process. We will have to engage with the community, with public safety, with the administration, and uh, come up with uh, uh, and, 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 and you know confirm a budget that, that makes sense for, for Columbus. Uh, we would invite you know uh, folks to come to the hearings as we, we walk through. I think. Uh, Councilmember Mitch Brown's hearing is December 2nd uh, that will go deeper into this process. Uh, Councilmember, do you have any, Mitch, uh, Chair Brown, do you have any other comments?
If not, yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm sorry, Council President, uh, the technology. I, I think part of the issue uh, is that in this upcoming budget is two classes for our, our division of police. Um, I think classes of 40 or 45, I'm not exactly certain what the number is. I know that addresses the issue to some degree of attrition, but they also are evaluating how they're going to utilize the staffing. Uh, so there's a lot of elements associated with it, and we'll hear from them when they present the budget. Thank you, Chair Brown. Again, we are, this is the beginning of a process from the council side. We look forward to engaging with and hearing from all of our residents. Uh, we are excited about partnering with the Saunders company uh, so that we can make sure that our outreach is far and wide, that we hear from uh, folks who don't traditionally engage uh, through uh, uh, processes like these. And so we invite you to be a part of reimagining public safety in Columbus. Again, I'm very appreciative to all of my colleagues uh, who uh, are taking the mantle um, and are continued uh, to be committed to moving this process forward. Thank you so much uh, and have a great afternoon.